Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have with us Aaron Smith-Levin. Aaron, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jeffrey. Glad to be here. Aaron, you are a second generation Scientologist. Yes, that's correct. And as we discussed before the show, you grew up in the David Miscavige era of Scientology. Yes. Could you give us a brief background of how your parents got into the church? Sure. So uh, so my mom and my dad were actually never married. And our mom is, uh, we grew up with our mom. And that was on the East Coast in, in Philadelphia, mostly throughout Philadelphia and New Jersey. And so my mom got into Scientology when my brother and I were, um, I want to say six years old. It might have been. It might have been a couple years earlier, but let's just say six. And that would have been in 1986. She joined staff pretty much right away. You know, she was pretty enthusiastic about the whole thing, very gung-ho. And she, and she joined staff. So my earliest memories of Scientology were being in the nursery at the Philadelphia Org with, uh, you know, 10 or 15 other kids, um, a pretty substandard nanny who we uh, ran all, all over ran all over her is the nursery school were you learning how to read and write no no it wasn't a school in any way it was it was just a nursery i mean it was really just a room in the back of the org where the kids could be behind a closed door um with someone supervising them um we still pretty much ended up running all around the org but all, no all it was it was essentially daycare that's what it was daycare for the so org daycare yeah. Now, did you did you go to kindergarten at a public school, or, or was your daytime at the org? I definitely went to kindergarten at a public school. Um, I was in public school from kindergarten to the sixth grade, and honestly, I don't remember how my mom juggled the school and the nursery. I just had the distinct, the distinct memories of being in the nursery and the distinct memories of being in school. But I think what would happen is. Um, uh, we would end up being in the org in the latter part of the day, like after school got out. Cause I definitely remember we would fall asleep at the org. And then when my mom was done post at like 10 o'clock at night, we'd all load up and go home. So I'm pretty sure that's how it worked. So you had a sense of uh, mom works a lot for Scientology. Did you have a, 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 any sense of difference between your, your life at public school and at the org where there are different sets of rules or did you, feel like a child, like it was all the same. No, in the nursery, it was pretty much all the same. And actually, now that you mentioned that, you just jogged my memory because my mom was definitely on staff at the org through um, the third grade. Because I remember we would have these little sit-down sessions in school where people would, for some reason, have to explain what the parents did for a living. And I remember sitting there in the circle going, you know, as, as an eight-year-old, <laughs> Literally thinking to myself, yeah. holy shit, what am I going to say when they get to me? <laughs> I have no idea what I'm going to say when they get to me. Um, so, yeah. what did you say? What did you say? Oh, God, I didn't even want to say. I remember even at the young age of eight thinking, I don't want to say she works at a church. But I don't, you know, it was just because I didn't think of Scientology as a church um, as an eight-year-old. And I don't. I just wanted to say, like, she works at the org, but I knew nobody was going to know what that meant. And I don't remember what I said. I just remember it was stressful for me. <laughs> well, I can I can imagine, uh, you know, growing up where people say my dad's a policeman, my mom's a nurse. Right. <laughs> yeah. How do you say? Well, my mom works for Scientology. Right. And then and then they have to, and you have to explain as an eight year old what the hell that means. Aaron, I have to ask you this question. You were in the Philadelphia org. That's where David Miscavige and his family were yeah. originally. Yeah. Did you have any pressure being in the Philadelphia org? Was that org held up as, hey, COB came from this org? You know, when we were training at FLAG, which we'll get into later, I'm sure, um, it wasn't pressure so much as almost a sort of pride, really. You know, everybody knew COB was from Philadelphia uh, when COB was in town. I remember I walked into an elevator one time with some people that had been come down to flag from it management. And, you know, they always say, you know, we were little kids still when I was training at flag. They'd say, oh, yeah. what org are you from? You say Philadelphia, knowing knowing that it would create an effect on them. Oh, we're from the Philadelphia org. And they'd say, oh, 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 you know, there's a lot of important people from Philadelphia. And we'd be like. Well, so that's like, the, that's like the Scientology equivalent of being from Harvard or <laughs> right. you know, Ivy League. There yeah. you go. And, you know, there was a supervisor um, in Philadelphia. His name is Sandy Lattimore who was supervising there when David Miscavige was on the communications course as a little child. Um, this wow. this guy had been there ever since the, the org was actually a mission in Ardmore. And um, yeah, so he was known. It was a known thing. Yeah, I imagine there'd be a lot of pride in that, as you say. Now, we were talking before the show, by 12 years old, you are an outer org trainee at FLAG. 
Yeah, so when we actually – when we joined staff at Philadelphia, I was 12. Um, by the time we finished kind of our basic runway of courses to qualify to go to flag, um, I think I uh, either was almost 13 or had just turned 13. So my, my years at flag training were mostly from 13 years old to 15 years old. 15 is when we finished our training lineups. It was during the first golden age of tech evolution and um, fired back to Philadelphia as the, uh, the delivery team for the golden age of tech. Now, let me get this straight. You're 15 years old. Mm -hmm. You have, this is the 19, 1996 period. That's right. You are a golden age of tech original trainee and they fire you back at 15 years of age mm -hmm. to Philadelphia to, to be an auditor or what, what is your job? Well, sorry, originally my training program was to be an auditor, but actually when they fired back the golden age of tech teams, they did not fire back any auditors. It was a, it was a team of supervisors and word clearers. So um, <clears throat> I was a supervisor and I fired back with another supervisor and another word and a word clearer, um, all, all of who were the same age as me. So <laughs> we were we were all fifteen or sixteen, and um, and so I go back to I fired Philadelphia, but my mom who was training at Flag she was training to be uh, a class uh, a class six senior CS, and and she stayed at Flag she had a lot more training to do so I fired back um, home basically by myself, um, I was staying with uh, my mom's best friend, who had a son my age, and. Uh, so I was actually living in South Jersey, taking a bus every day into Philadelphia, about a 45-minute bus ride into Philadelphia. Um, I would be there by 9 o'clock in the morning or 8.30, and I would be on post until 10 o'clock at night. I would catch a 10.20 bus home and you know, be home by about 11 o'clock at night and uh, you know, walk a half hour from the bus stop to home. Like It's one of those things, walking uphill in the snow both ways. Um, and this was totally normal to me. It was totally normal to me because it was the same schedule that I had been working for the last three years at Flag. You know, sun up to sun down. It just I just thought nothing of it. It wasn't it wasn't necessarily even a an arduous thing for me to do. It was just what it was. It was just life. <laughs> sure, because you know, children only know what they grow up in. Right. So if you work long hours, that's just how life is in the Church of Scientology. Uh, Aaron, did you have a sense of mission and purpose? Were you a, a gung-ho Scientologist? Um, extremely so, like extremely so. When I was at Flag, um, it was actually a great experience for me. Even the long hours, even the hard, uh, what some might characterize as child labor, you know, <laughs> moving refrigerators downstairs, doing demolition, doing HVAC work. Honestly, I look back on that and it wasn't a bad thing for me. It was actually a good experience. Um, so you would... Was it like practical work experience? It, it was honestly, yeah, it was real life experience is sort of what I, how I took it. Um, and the, the work ethic that it instilled, you know, but I, I also recognize that my experience in many ways was a lot better than most. Like children growing up in the cadet org have a much different experience because also part of what contributes to their negative experience is they're separated from their parents. I was with my mom the whole time I was training a flag. You know, we lived in separate apartments, but, it, but as a young kid, that's kind of cool. You know, I was living in an apartment with my friends. She was living in an apartment with her friends. And I see her every day. I see her every day. I see her on course. I see her at meal times. I see her at the, the muster times. So for me, that wasn't a, a weird element of it being separated from my parents, right? So, but the point I was actually getting to there is while I was at Flag, um, I decided I wanted to join the Sea Org. Uh, all my friends that I was there with were pretty much Sea Org members. Um, I liked what they were doing. I just, I, it was basically the life that I was living for three years was essentially a Sea Org life. Um, they wouldn't let me join the Sea Org because I was from the Philadelphia Org, and if they if if people from outer orgs go to Flag and they all end up joining the Sea Org, the outer orgs will stop sending their staff for training. <laughs> oh, I see. And so actually, what they wouldn't let me join the Sea Org. So by the time I got back to Philadelphia, I fired back to Philadelphia, my purpose was to completely get myself replaced and join the Sea Org. Like I considered myself to essentially be a soldier for David Miscavige. And, um, and before I left this, before we fired from Flag, there was about 200 of us training at Flag who were all minors. Um, they made it a point to talk to all of us and, and see if we were interested in joining the Sea Org and signing us up for the Sea Org before we left so that they could kind of have, uh, have dibs on uh, which orgs we were going to go to when we finally did get ourselves replaced and, and joined the Sea Org. So before I left, I signed a Sea Org contract with CMO Clearwater, um, actually Jenny DeVocht, who, uh, the famous Jenny. And Angie Blankenship are the ones who um, who signed me up, 
And so, but your original question was that I have a sense of purpose uh, to an incredible degree, um, a huge sense of purpose. I felt um, I was one of the more dedicated people I, I had ever met. Um, like nobody was more dedicated than me. There were plenty of people as dedicated as me, but I didn't consider that there was anybody more dedicated. It, it was pretty, pretty strong. Well, then that would stand out uh, an idealistic, enthusiastic, hardworking young person. Yeah. And I, I could see why uh, no less than Jenny DeVocht and Angie Blankenship, those are big people in the church. Yeah. So you recruited for Sea Org. Now, one thing I want to clarify our listeners who may have never been in the Church of Scientology, you and I keep talking about being fired off, fired off. What does that mean to non-Scientology listeners to be fired off? Yeah, well, you know, it's a kind of, I guess, a, a military term, even though I can't say I've ever actually heard it used by anyone in the military. It basically means to be sent off on a, on a mission. In the Sea Org, there's a department that sends uh, two or three Sea Org members at a time off to an org to get very specific tasks done. And those people are called a mission. And when a mission goes off to an org, it's called their firing to an org. So it's a positive thing. It's a good thing. So when you fire, it means you're done with your training. You're going back to your org with your orders to get executed and you're firing as a team. It's like, it, it's a positive term. Okay. Now, go, now going back, you fire off from Flagland Base in Clearwater, Florida. Yep. Now you've signed a CR contract with CMO, which is the Commodore's Messenger organization. Right. Can you tell our listeners what CMO means in the in the hierarchy of the church? Sure. So in the current day church, the Commodore's Messenger Org is the senior most organization within the corporate Church of Scientology International. So the, the, the essential function of CMO is to put management there and make sure they are managing. You know, there's these redundant levels in Scientology. So international management... Um, they're the ones who are supposed to be actual managing. That's Guillaume Lasserre, theoretically, if he were actually on post as executive director international, he would be the senior actual manager in the Church of Scientology International. But above, but above the executive director, director international is the CMO. And the CMO are the ones who are supposed to make sure international management is actually there and doing their job correctly. So they, they are an essentially the senior most managing body because they manage management is a good way to put it. So you're, you, you have a contract with CMO, but you're sent back to uh, Philadelphia and your goal there is to replace yourself because in Scientology, you can't move up unless you replace yourself. That's right. So how long did it take you to replace yourself at Philadelphia? I never did. It took me that long. <laughs> 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 it was remarkably hard to recruit people to join staff. And when they did join staff, they didn't tend to stick around for very long. So the short answer is I never did succeed in replacing myself. However, seven years later, right, uh, when my five-year contract was up, I took a little two-year hiatus. Um, after, after three years, I would sort of had enough and I actually left and I moved to Los Angeles and uh, lived a normal life for a couple of years. But then I actually went back to Philadelphia to finish the last two years on my contract because I had this enormous freeloader debt, which we'll, I'm sure we'll get to later. Basically seven years after I initially went back to Philadelphia, my contract was almost up and I was getting ready to just pack my stuff up and go back and uh, live a normal life in Los Angeles. And what happened is two people who I knew from the Philadelphia Org Nursery um, who had joined the Sea Org and one of them went off and became LRHCOM International, uh, extremely senior management position in the church. She happened to come back to Philadelphia for a wedding of one of her family members. And this was almost, almost just a month or two before my contract was expiring. And seeing her again and seeing that she was LRHCOM International and her sister was a recruiter for Asho Day, um, they basically called me up a couple of weeks later and was like, uh, hey, uh, would you still like to join the Sea Org? And I'm like, uh, hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, oh, we're, we're thinking of getting it done this, uh, this Thursday before two. And I'm, and I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking, okay, it's been seven years. You want to get it done in three days. Good luck. Right. So even in the back of my head, I'm sort of thinking, you know what? I'm going to tell them yes, but when it fails, I'll be okay with that. Cause I want to go back and live in LA anyway. Well, sure. well, they made it happen Thursday before two. <laughs> <laughs> and really what they did is they came, um, they did this funny thing where, Oh, you're going to love this, Jeffrey. So there's tons of Eastern Europeans that want to come to the United States, Scientologists. 
Correct. And the way they do it, they can do it by, they can get visas, they can get religious visas by um, one thing that they do is they contact a Sea Org recruiter, okay? And they say, look, I don't want to join the Sea Org, but I'm willing to replace someone else in an org who does want to join the Sea Org. Really? That's... Yeah. So this guy, his name is Jan. He was from the Czech Republic. They said, Jan, we've got someone who wants to join the Sea Org. Come to Los Angeles. We'll get you a religious visa to come and work at one of the churches here, but we'll only give you the visa if you agree to go to the org we want you to go to so that you can replace someone who wants to move up to the Sea Org. So Jan arrives in Los Angeles thinking, you know, he's about to live the good life in LA and yeah. they spring on him. Oh no, I'm sorry. Did we forget to mention you're going to Philadelphia? <laughs> <laughs> oh, he was that... furious. He was furious. <laughs> and they basically, and he didn't want to do it. And, yeah. and they said, uh, you're going to do it. Or we're going to guess you send you back on a plane and send your ass back to the Czech Republic. And he goes, <laughs> okay, I'll do it. And so what they, they replaced me with Jan. Now Jan wasn't a supervisor. So they put him into the technical training core, which is the group of staff members that are training to go onto a technical post. So they basically replaced me with someone on the TTC and Jan eventually does breaks his contract and leaves the org. So, but that's sort of what they do is they replace permanent people with temporary people and then the temporary people leave and then the org is, is screwed. And that's, that's, that's a, that's a story that repeats itself quite often. Let's pause this for a minute because the abuse of religious worker visas mm -hmm. in America, and it's not unique to Scientology. So if, if, uh, a seer worker comes from over from Estonia or, you know, wherever, uh, Latvia, Czech Republic, and they're in a, on a five-year staff contract and they don't like it and they blow, are they deported? Do they have to go back or do they stay in the U.S.? Well, I guess it depends on, on whether they have blown just the org or whether they have actually left Scientology. And, and, and if they left Scientology, good luck tracking them down. And, you know, I'm sure the INS has better things to do. Um, but I think if you actually have come over on a religious visa and you're in an org, these guys tend to want to stay in Scientology. You know, they're in a foreign land. Um, they, they usually were already exposed to Scientology before they came over, right? They came over as Scientologists. Right. They're not really in a state of mind to just up and leave Scientology one day. So, you know, they tend to stick around. So, you know, Jan left Philadelphia, but he didn't leave Scientology. He's actually lives here in Clearwater. I, I ran him in the grocery store every now and then. He's still a Scientologist. He's, he's here at Flag. He's on course. His wife's a Scientologist. He's got kids and everything. So I just remember that it did not go well for him in Philadelphia, and he either – yeah, I, I might have even misstated it. I, I think he might have um, uh, maybe only left after two and a half years instead of staying for the full five years or something like that. But um, it, it, it just went really south. His relationship with the Philadelphia Org just went completely south, and he ended up leaving. But, but he did wind up in the United States. Oh, yeah, he's here. Is, oh, which, he's yeah, here. Which is, which is what he wanted. And uh, I think that the, the, the appeal to – go work for a Scientology organization as opposed to maybe staying in a lot of other countries would be very strong Yeah, as a way to get to the United States. So it's certainly a pathway uh, to U.S. residency. Without question, but, yeah. Well, that good for Jan. He winds up in the U.S. Yeah. You wind up in the Sea Org in Los Angeles. That's right. What's your first post? Uh, I was recruited to be the tech sec at Ashaday, the technical secretary. So that's the head of Division four, which is the division where all of the um, auditing and training that's delivered to public occurs. It's a pretty big post, pretty big post for the first post in the Sea Org. Well, the, now ASHO, uh, American St. Hill Organization, mm -hmm. that's where the, the sculpture of the lion is. That's right. At, on, around Harvard Way. What does ASHO do? What kind of services do they deliver? So um, the ASHO, by the way, it stands for, like you said, the American St. Hill Organization. The St. Hill in that name um, is there because ASHOs are the only orgs that deliver the St. Hill Special Briefing Course, or I should say St. Hill Orgs. And again, this is terrible. Not to be confused with a St. Hill Size Org, <laughs> but an org that has St. Hill in its name has that in its name because it delivers the St. Hill Special Briefing Course, which is the Class 6 Auditor Course, um, the, essentially the most comprehensive um, chronological study of LRH lectures and bulletins that exist in Scientology. Um, so yeah, ASHO, it delivers all services that a normal org would deliver, but it also delivers the St. Hill Special Briefing Course, and it also delivers a special auditing action called Power Processing and Power Plus. Um, but other than that, we actually are in direct, we were in direct competition with every other org in the world in Scientology, including the org that was right next door to us, the LA Org. And 
And um, that, that's one of the things that led to a lot of craziness in the Sea Org in Los Angeles is all of the orgs are constantly fighting with each other over public and trying to cannibalize each other's business. It was a real um, debacle, actually. When you're at uh, the complex, as we call it here in Los Angeles, and I just live a few blocks from it. Sure. When you're competing for the same public, the same pre-clears, how do you guys negotiate? Is it is it winner take all or does it get nasty? Or like, let's say Joe, Joe is a pre-clear who wants some auditing. And are there, how many orgs could he go to for that five? He could go to Celebrity Center. He could go to Los Angeles Day, Los Angeles Foundation, Astro Day, Astro Foundation, or AOLA. So what is that? Two, four, six orgs right there. All, all, all <laughs> delivering the exact same service. Now, technically, even though they're all allowed to deliver the exact same service, they're not supposed to be delivering the exact same service. And that's where, you know, the orders and the policies end up getting crossed up. Like technically their licensing agreement with the Church of Scientology International allows the orgs to all deliver the same service. But the reason you had Los Angeles org, the, you know, the, the way the, uh, the LRH, L. Ron Hubbard way was designed with these orgs there was that someone was supposed to do all of their lower level services at the Los Angeles org because it was the right there. It's a classified org. That's where public are supposed to get into Scientology. Then they were supposed to graduate to ASHO to do their St. Hill special briefing course. And then they were supposed to go across the street to AOLA to go do their class eight course. And on the auditing side of things, they were supposed to do all their auditing up to clear in Los Angeles org. Then they were supposed to do their OT. I'm going to use some words that we haven't defined yet, but sure. uh, their OT preparations, their OT eligibility and their power processing was supposed to be done at the at ASHO. And then they were supposed to do all their OT levels at AOLA. Well, in a perfect world um, where there's enough people actually going up the bridge from Scientology's viewpoint, that would be a perfect world. There's no reason to fight over public and the, the organizations can just deliver the services that management intended them to deliver. But when there's a scarcity of public, man, it's no holds barred. People just cannibalizing everyone's business all over the place. And it really led to a lot of insanity that actually doesn't happen at Flag because Flag is just one org. Who are you going to fight with? There's no one to fight with over public. Um, but because there's all these different orgs that all have their own captains, that are all answerable for their own stats, that are all going to go to the RPF if they don't make it go right, then it gets really ugly. Well, I could imagine it would be internecine warfare. Now, you mentioned flag. Is flag tours come to Los Angeles, you know, often enough? Mm -hmm. Was flag ever competing for LA preclears to come back to flag? Well, uh, the answer is yes. And it, it, you know, when flag comes to town to send people to to take LA public and send them to flag, you know, the pitch is always. Um, give us the public you're having trouble with. Give us the public who you're too busy to service. Well, that sounds like a nice message and you think uh, an offer like that would be perceived as helpful. Um, but the fact is those trouble public are still the public keeping the stats up in the org. <laughs> There's no such thing as public. We were too busy to, to service. We didn't have enough public to service. So flag comes to town with a nice message and you know at least they're a, a promise of help. But the truth is, they have to get their stats up as well. They need to get a certain amount of public to flag. So they end up taking the public that we can't really afford to lose. And it's just, uh, that's just how it goes. That's just how it goes from, they call it bridge control. Bridge control is when a higher org um, puts pressure on a lower org to flow public up the bridge. And the idea is that if you suck the public out of the org, you create a vacuum and new public come in to the org for service. It just doesn't actually work that way, unfortunately. No, it doesn't work that way in real life. Now, let's add another layer. Let me throw another problem at you. Yeah. Okay, so you're with ASHO. Mm -hmm. Flags putting pressure to get people to, to clear water. Yeah. What happens when you mix in an IAS reg cycle? How, what, what's the role of the IAS in the church? How much trouble do they cause on top of the existing competition? Yeah, the IAS, it's funny. There's a couple different ways to look at it. Um, uh, you'd think that because of all the IAS regging, um, well, let me, let me give you a, a succinct answer. The, one of the biggest troubles that the IAS created is they would go in and their regs are so well-trained and they are so dedicated and they are so will not take no for an answer. The difference between the message of an IAS reg and the message of a Scientology reg who's trying to sell you auditing is the IAS reg 
can go in there so hard sell and say, no, 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 your donation that I am demanding of you is to save the world. Like we are saving the world. If I'm trying to sell you auditing, all I can do is I'm trying to save you. But if you don't give a shit about yourself, <laughs> if you don't really give a shit about yourself or you don't really want the help, I can't get your money. But the IAS regs, oh my God, they could go into someone who was bone dry and suck out $50,000. So what would happen is once the IAS regs sort of you know, did their thing, it was very hard for the church regs to go behind them and actually sell auditing because people were just tapped out, right? Um, but the other thing that would happen all the time is uh, – you know, when, when someone's in an org getting auditing, there's a waiting area where they sit and the, uh, there's a PC, a pre-clear waiting area. And that's where the IES regist would come. And they would just come to people sitting in the waiting area and sit down and not get up. Like here's a person trying to relax in between auditing sessions or, or he's waiting for his auditing session. You know, he's, he doesn't want to get all upset before his session so he doesn't have to waste time <laughs> addressing rudiments and auditing. And the IES regist will just sit down. And they do not give a shit whether you're waiting for a session, whether you're between sessions, whether you're getting ready to leave for the day. They will sit down because they know they have the entire support of David Miscavige and RTC and international management behind them. They can harass you. There's nothing a public can do to get an IAS reg off their back. Who are they going to submit a complaint to? The ethics officer? Well, the IAS reg was mean to me and wouldn't leave me alone. Nobody cares. <laughs> <laughs> they can well, get away with anything. <laughs> okay, so what? So our our fictional PC Joe is waiting between sessions, right? Yeah. Now Joe's auditor comes out. Joe's with the IES reg. What happens? Did Joe get to go back in session? Yeah, the IES reg pretty much. You know, the IES reg's goal is to make it a problem for the PC, so that the oh. PC has to address it in auditing. The PC because if if a preclear goes into session and starts criticizing someone, the auditor is almost bound by the you know, technical instructions to ask the preclear what overts he has against the IES reg. What have you done? <laughs> what, are, what, have you, what are you withholding that the IES reg failed to find out about you? And so it becomes such a hassle for the preclear that the preclear is just going to pay the money to get, get the damn reg off his back so that he can stop being harassed between sessions and stop having to, he, he's paying for those auditing hours where he's having to now answer questions on, what withholds he has from the IS registrar, right? <laughs> so you're you're not going to get it. You're not when the IS has it wired in, right into session. That's right. And so the the answer to your question is yes, the preclear would be allowed to go into session, but now he's going to be, you know, spend an hour of auditing addressing his how pissed off he is at the IS webs that he won't leave him alone. You know. Yeah, his 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 ARC break with the IES. Well, that's interesting. Now, let's talk about weekly stats. Mm -hmm. You live or die. In Scientology, in the Sea Org, every Thursday at 2 p.m. Live or die, yes. Your fate is decided. Talk to me about stats. What for our non-Scientology listeners? Can you give us an overview of what stats are in the church and why Thursday at 2 p.m. is such a big deal? Do you mean like what stats are in general? Yeah, yeah, and within Scientology, the meaning of stats. Okay, so stats is just a statistic. A statistic is a measurement of a quantity plotted over a period of time. Everything in Scientology has a statistic. Um, if you're studying in a course room, uh, you know, there, there's a point system assigned to every page that you read or every word that you look up in a dictionary or anything. Like, there's points assigned to the actions that you do as a student so that you can quantify your production as a student. Um, you know, as an auditor in an organization, your statistic is number of hours of auditing that you delivered that had a good result. Um, like, literally every post... Every post usually has three or four statistics. Every department has three or four statistics. Every division has three or four statistics. Every executive has three or four stats. Um, you know, an org probably has about 200 stats that are reported up to management every single week, Thursday at 2. Thursday at 2, I have no actual idea why Thursday at 2 was picked. It's extremely an inconvenient time. Um, but that is when the week ends. The week ends and begins at Thursday at 2 o'clock. And all it's called stat evolution, stat ev, if you want to be really cool. Um, so stat ev starts uh, promptly Thursday at two. Everyone's supposed to have their stats up to management by a particular time. It's not possible to get the stats up by that time. Um, but you know, all the orgs in the world report up all the same stats, and you know, management has a very clear idea of of what's going on. Assuming stats aren't being falsified, which of course they do, because there's so much emphasis put on whether you live or die based on your stats. So they get falsified all the time. 
Now, this is interesting. Would it be fair to say that stats are performance metrics? Yes, accurate, totally. Okay. So these performance metrics, uh, you have seven days, and then you turn in your stats Thursday at 2 p.m., what happens if you're down stat? What happens if you're up stat? Well, it kind of depends on which organization you're in. Um, I'll give you an example. The IAS regs, I know for a fact, any week where they um, raise less money than they did the week before, they have to do a full OW write-up as a part of their condition, period. No question about it. It doesn't matter. Um, and what is an, an, an OW write-up? So an o, OW, O stands for overt, and W stands for withhold. And an overt is something you did that is bad. Let's just keep it very simple. Something you did that was a violation of the ethics uh, or moral code of the group. And a withhold is just times when somebody sort of missed, you know, somebody reminded you of your overt and, and they, it's called missing, missing the withhold. You have a withhold, you, you're withholding it. You're not telling someone, right? So, um, you know, when you're writing down your overts and withholds is you're literally putting pen to paper and you are writing down everything you can think of that you did bad that week. <laughs> like, time, place, <laughs> form, and event. When did you do it? Where did you do it? What exactly did you do? And how did it happen? You know, uh, and, and until you feel better. So that implies you were feeling bad in the first place, but you weren't. Your stats were just down. <laughs> But, there, but look at the Scientology system of mind control. If you do not meet your production statistic, yeah. then you must have some kind of crime, some kind of overt or withhold. That's right. In, in, in other words, you're, in, you're out ethics. That's right. So inst instead of realistically looking at a finite market for Scientology goods and services, right. Aaron Hubbard's belief is that there should be an infinite demand. That's right. Let me tell you a hilarious anecdote relating to this that um, please so because it was so uh, Scientology management the, the Scientology management management system ingrains into you that there is no good reason for a down statistic other than the fact that somebody didn't work hard enough to get it up and any attempt to provide an explanation that was outside of your own control they call it the why is God you know the reason for this is God <laughs> so it literally could be you know for example saying that the stats were down because it was Christmas week and everyone was on vacation no no that's not an acceptable answer <laughs> so the anecdote here is that when I actually started getting into um, working in the stock market and researching public companies and listening to the quarterly conference calls that you know the managements of these giant public companies do when I first started hearing people saying things like um, yeah, we had um, 10 extra days of bad weather this quarter compared to last year. I was so ingrained to think that it was wrong to actually give proper explanations for why something was down. <laughs> I was thinking to myself, listen to these incompetent fools blaming their statistics on the weather. <laughs> <laughs> when, of course, in the real world, you have to look for real reasons why the stat was not just down, but maybe not as high as you wanted it to be. Like having a typhoon is a legitimate reason, not in Scientology, though. <laughs> well, let, let me give you a, an example. Uh, no, when I uh, in corporate life one year, we had a warehouse back east. This was in the 90s. Yeah. And record snowfall actually collapsed the roof on one of our pivotal East Coast warehouses. Right. And it destroyed all the merchandise. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was like going to be a six or eight week outage because the factory had to make up production. From the Scientology man management perspective, if I came to you and said, Aaron, the, the snow collapsed the roof, we're, we're up the creek without a paddle for six or eight weeks, what do you say to me as a Scientology executive if this were a Scientology company? Well, the approach would be not that, oh, well, that's not true. That's not going to delay production. The approach to it would be everyone who works in that warehouse must be a complete criminal to have pulled it in. <laughs> you pulled it in. Because of your overts and your withholds, <laughs> right, the universe yeah. conspired to take a giant shit on your warehouse. <laughs> <laughs> Which, Jeffrey, if you recall, that's the famous story that we hear from people who are at in management in, yeah. in the mid-90s when that big um, flash flood wiped, uh, you know, that big landslide oh, yeah, wiped out part base, of Golden yeah. Air Productions. Well, what did David Miscavige do? He rounded up the whole base and basically said, this is your fault. How the hell could it be their fault? You know, but that, well, that, well, that goes. That's that's interesting. Let's explore that. In Scientology, you are personally responsible for everything. Yes. So if 
if me, if I pulled in this giant snowstorm on my warehouse and the roof collapsed, yeah. I must have crimes. Exactly. And and that's why we hear about Sea Org. Would I be put on extensive sec checking until I find out why I destroyed the roof on the factory? Oh, absolutely. It would be what evil purposes do you have? You know, because they, they think you're you're natively at cause over everything, including the physical universe. And and even though they can't demonstrate that on a day to day basis, when it comes to blaming people for stuff, they absolutely think that way. Yeah, so it would be sec checking, find out your overs and your withholds and and your evil purposes against the organization until you answered up. I mean, for dozens and scores of hours with actual evil purposes you had against the organization. You, even if it was evil purposes that you had in previous lifetimes, like that's how crazy it would get. That is indeed insane. Uh, rather than just moving on and dealing with the actual problem, you're gonna brutalize talented executives. Exactly. Now, one thing that's interesting that we were talking about before the show when you're in the Sea Org, you get paid $46 a week. Yep. On a good week. Bad weeks, you get paid less or you get paid nothing. Right. And one thing you mentioned to me was that you had to buy your own uniforms in the Sea Org. Yes. Now, it's not standard operating procedure that from day one, everyone always has to buy their own uniforms. Like when you join the Sea Org, or when you, when you actually get put on post, you are given your uniform. Um, usually a few shirts, a couple pants. But if you need new uniform parts, that's where the problem comes in. Oh, okay. Um, and replacement uniform parts. So I, you know, it's not uncommon to see, at least when I was in the Sea Org, to, to see um, veteran Sea Org members with uh, shoes that the, with the soles that had holes in them because the soles were worn through, um, or uh, uh, shirts that had elbows with holes in the elbows because they simply couldn't get uniform parts. And then, and what I was saying is that if a Sea Org member wanted uniform parts. He either just had to wait until somehow the money got approved in financial planning, or he'd have to just use money out of his own pocket. He could take money out of his own pocket, walk over to the uniform exchange, which is run by a Sea Org member, and pay cash full price for uniform parts. You'd think the uniform exchange would just give out uniform parts. No, no, they sell them. The org, the, the uniform exchange is run by one org. They procure all the uniform parts. They won't give them to Sea Org members unless the specific org that Sea Org member works in forks over hard cash for those uniform parts. Full price, like full price. There's no wholesale discount occurring here. There's no Sea Org discounts. Um, and and it, was a, it was a problem. Sea Org members could not get new uniform parts, which is just embarrassing. Okay, so Aaron, you're on Ash Show. Yeah. You need, you need a new shirt. Right. Because your existing shirt, you know, like business shirts, especially white ones, they kind of get yellow under the armpits. Oh, yeah. Just because, I mean, you work. I had to wear white shirts all the time, and I would just, you know, donate the shirts to Goodwill when they got a little unsightly. Yeah. Because as a salesperson, I had to look good. I was really, my, my, my appearance was very important. That was part of why I was paid to have nice clothing, have spotless, you know, button-down shirts, white or blue were the only colors allowed under the old IBM dress code, as they called it. Mm -hmm. So... So when I needed a new shirt, I had the money to go buy it. Mm -hmm. How much did it cost you to, to get a new shirt? Um, I actually have the price list somewhere, but off the top of my head, I want to say maybe $25 for a shirt, for a Sea Org shirt. Um, that was a, uh, each one of the orgs out in Los Angeles have a different, actually a different style uniform. So that's the other thing. You think if they were smart, they just have similar uniforms and you could buy massive amounts of uniform parts for a very low price, but they don't do it that way. Um, so I would say about $25, $30 for a shirt. Well, now that's interesting. They don't standardize uniforms to save costs. Yeah, they don't. I mean, we, we know as businessmen from Southwest Airlines, they standardize on the 737 to get an economy of scale and maintenance, purchase, acquisition. You know, you have a fleet. Yeah. But if everyone has different uniforms, you either have to get different suppliers or pay more for lower. So that's just an interesting, um, metric when we look when we analyze uh, the church of scientology as a business yeah and you know back in the day when the actual sea org navy style uniform was a little more in vogue uh they probably did have that economy of scale but they've gradually um drifted away from the actual navy style uniform they've gone to these other uniforms that kind of make you look like a bellhop um but but, <laughs> but you know each org has a different color shirt well, that's a completely different uniform, a different color shirt and a different and a different cut. And really only Sea Org missionaries or people from international management who come down ever have the traditional 
what they call the Class A Sea Org uniform, which is the Navy style uniform with the epaulets and the bars and the chevrons and whatnot. That's the, it's not that's not the default Sea Org uniform anymore. Yeah, Aaron, going back, not only do orgs compete with each other for preclears, but they have to compete with each other. You know, like one, if I'm the uniform guy, I have to sell you a uniform parts right and and for our listeners uniform parts are just mean we would call them replacement clothing right <laughs> so you need a new pair of pants and the sea org it's called uniform parts right so if i'm with the uniform department i'm going to sell you parts and uh, you have to pay me right now you have a ridiculously funny story about e-meters and silver certifications i want you to tell the audience i this is so funny about <laughs> So and why the, yeah. it's funny, the absurdity of this story didn't even actually hit me until you and I were chatting. Um, because you'd think that any normal organization is working to lower its own internal costs, right? It's, it's looking to provide, um, uh, the, the, provide the goods that are required for operations at as low cost as possible. So in an org, one of the most important pieces of equipment is an e-meter. You can't deliver auditing without an e-meter. Um, in a course room, the e-meters are used for various kinds of word clearing. They're used for doing meter checks. Uh, every part of how to deliver Scientology to a public, uh, almost every part requires an e-meter. So uh, I would say at ASHO, we probably had 150 to 200 e-meters in the building, right? Well, um, Golden Era Productions requires that an e-meter be um, certified, recertified every two years. And it's called a silver certificate because there's a little metal plate on the bottom of the e-meter that's a silver color that says when the meter was last certified. So it is a crime in Scientology to operate an e-meter that has an expired certificate, right? So what would happen yeah. though is we couldn't afford to silver cert all of our e-meters by the time they would expire. And, and really the whole silver certing thing was a scam. It's not like these things just went bad after two years, but it costs, you have to pay Golden Era Productions $210 per e-meter just to you know, hook it up to a calibration machine and make sure everything's still good. So every two years, you pay Golden Era Productions $210 to recertify your meter. Well, you would think that Golden Era Productions would offer for free to recertify all of the e-meters that are being used in the Sea Org orgs. I mean, that would just make sense. Well, it does because that's the e-meter is the workhorse of the org. Right. You're producing money with that meter. Right. Right. So yeah, yeah. If, if if it were my company, yeah, we'll silver cert them. Well, that's not the but way what? it works. So, the so as an org, we had to pay Golden Air Productions two hundred and ten dollars per e meter to recertify them. But we didn't have that kind of money lying around to just do that for all these e meters. So the Golden the gold there's a representative um, in Los Angeles for Golden Air Productions. His job is to, um, you know, make sure that the films are being displayed properly and to collect any money. Due to gold, so his uh, his post title is called the gold rep, the gold representative. So the gold rep would go through the org, confiscating any e meter <laughs> whose silver certificate had expired, and would not return them until he was given two hundred and ten dollars per e meter. <laughs> In which case, he would just put the e meter on the regularly scheduled um, run out to int management, and they would be certified and come back a few days later. Like they wouldn't even provide the service to a C org <laughs> org, which is truly incredible. They, they, I mean, they're holding the e meters hostage for cash. <laughs> no wait. Uh, so I, when I take my car in, you know, for uh, servicing, yeah, <clears throat> I get a loaner car. Right. Now, does Golden Era give you a loaner meter? Oh God, no. No, you'd think that what they would do is just cert the e-meter and then say that you owe gold the money and then just, you know, collect the money over time. You think that's what they would do. That They would never, yeah. they don't have loaner e-meters lying around. They want cash up front. You know, uh, an interesting data point, uh, there was a critic, uh, Lady Bird, her name's Lori Cunius, around 2005, and she was in a position to know, and, and she's passed away, God rest her soul. But Lady Bird said at one point around 2005, there were 25,000 silver certed e-meters in the world. Interesting. Now she was in a position to know, you as a Sea Org member, what does 25,000 e-meters tell you about the size and membership of the church? Well, it kind of makes sense, right? So if you do 25,000 
and you just divide it by 200 orgs. There's less than that now, but you know, over time there's been about 200. That's about hmm. 125 emitters per org. Well, if you consider those that 125 is supposed to account for all the emitters in the org, all the emitters owned by staff, all the emitters owned by public on course and auditors, you know, it kind of makes sense. It kind of makes sense. Now, you know, every auditor has two emitters. So if you have 25,000 emitters and you assume they're all assigned to auditors, which they're not, um, that's only 12,000 auditors in the entire world from the history of t from the history of in, from the beginning of Scientology. It, hmm. It's a pathetically small number. Like at, literally, every auditor has at least two emitters. There's no such thing as an auditor that only has one emitter. Sure, and that's a Hubbard policy. You have to have two in case one breaks. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's uh, <clears throat> yeah. My emitter broke. Good thing I have a spare. Right. And uh, now they have the new the new. Uh, better emitter that's 50,000 times better. Praise Jesus. No kidding. Now, I got to say one thing uh, about Scientology's business model. Yeah. When the basics came out, was it 2006? The books? Uh, yeah. You know, the libraries? Yeah, 2006. Yeah. The thing that stood out to me is I said, wait a minute, David Miscavige, chairman of the board, Religious Technology Center, his job was to guarantee the ecclesiastical purity of the Scientology religion and the products. I know. So, when David Miscavige made his speech that all the prior books he had been selling under the imprimatur and the authority of RTC, mm -hmm. he stands up and tells Scientologists the transcriptionists were from the wrong side of the gene pool. Right. I thought, why you criminal? I know. You're the one who up until that you just said that out of your mouth, you were saying that these were authentic RTC approved devices. I know. Suddenly they're not. And I know people, uh, the church was sending teams out to grab old books and pulp them. Burn them. Yeah, orgs had, orgs had orders to burn them. Really? Burn them? Yeah. That's stunning. So they wanted to get rid of all the old books and you had to buy new libraries. Yeah, which is really sacrilege. I mean, it really is. Even, even you know, there's some things over the last few years that the church has pushed out as strategies that has really um, had a negative impact on the field. And telling everyone to burn their old materials was one of them. You know, because people really value those old materials. If anything, they're historical artifacts. Like, to say burn them means they're dangerous. If anything, you keep them to show your great-grandchildren. Oh, let me show you this old version I had of this. They didn't want them around anymore. Hmm. That is, that's real curious. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's showing the typical Church of Scientology approach to destroying history. I know. I, I often tell reporters who are, who are new uh, to Scientology stories... I say, go online and look for Mary Sue Hubbard. You will find her nowhere on a Church of Scientology official website. She's a non-person. Right. Likewise, Shelley Miscavige, you won't find her anywhere. So these older books, uh, the, the church as an organization is big on destroying its history, revising its history. Yeah. And on the other hand, making money while doing so. Big time. I mean, so, look, I was raised in Scientology my entire life, in the Sea Org for four years, on staff for almost 15 years. I didn't know LRH had more than a couple of kids. I didn't know, really? I never knew LRH had been married before Mary Sue until, uh, you know, Going Clear came out, like literally. Really? Yeah, seriously. But Aaron, look at the, okay, th this is uh, fascinating. What did you know about L. Ron Hubbard when you were in the Sea Org? So, uh, I mean, obviously I knew a lot about L. Ron Hubbard, but, um, the answer is everything that's just in – okay, if you were to take those L. Ron Hubbard of Profile magazines that have been released that have sort of now been um, – are being billed as LRH's biography. Apparently the biography sure. is coming out. Like everything in those magazines is, um, is pretty consistent with the picture that's been painted of LRH throughout the years at international events. That's the stuff <clears throat> that I knew of L. Ron Hubbard. And by the way, it never crossed my mind as a Seward member that any of the data in these events – was inaccurate or exaggerated or outright lies. It's embarrassing to say that now, but it never even crossed my mind. So, you know, the idea that LRH, um, you know, he was in the military, he did whatever he did. Oh, you know, he sunk the submarine. He, you know, went right on to right on to post as a as a lieutenant. Well, that was always a big deal because in the Sea Org, a lieutenant is a very high rank. Now, really? now in the military, it's not a very high rank, but in the Sea Org, it's like very. It's the highest the Sea Org member can actually go in rank. Aside, as far as the rank you can actually earn, lieutenant is the highest. Yeah. So, of course, I see, you know, LRH with lieutenant bars and you're like, oh, my God, he's a lieutenant in the military. They really liked him, you know. 
<laughs> but I want to, Aaron, let me seize on that for a moment. Yeah. Because L. Ron Hubbard could really literally create the church any way he wanted to, mm -hmm. by controlling the Sea Org system of ranks, he could, the Sea Org members, inflate the sense of the real rank he had in the U.S. Navy. Absolutely. In fact, Jeffrey, I have to just tell you something that cracks me up even thinking about it. Please. The, the rank of captain in the Sea Org uh, had such a significance to me. There's There was only three captains in the whole Sea Org when I was growing up in the Sea Org. It was David Miscavige. It was... Ray Midoff, uh, not Ray Midoff, it was David Miscavige, Mark Yeager, and Guillaume Serve. And, and it was such an important rank. When I would go into an airport and I would see someone walk by with four stripes on their sleeve, I was almost like, oh, I was like, oh my God, it's a captain. It was just a pilot of the flight. <laughs> it was just a pilot of the flight. But um, it was such an important thing in my consciousness as what a captain was, you know? <laughs> so do you, uh, the captain had the equivalent of a four star general. Yeah, exactly. Four-star four admiral. Now, did you believe that L. Ron Hubbard was a war hero? Well, yes. I mean, I guess, and, and war hero can be used, you know, somewhat loosely. You don't have to have a parade in your Certainly. honor to be a war hero. But yes, the, the understanding was that um, uh, very highly commended and, you know, never actually saw battle, but there was the thing about sinking the subs. And, you know, one of the international events uh, that's held annually is for his birthday, and Golden Era Productions usually puts on a really incredible video display um, with interviews of people who knew L LRH in the past to say what an awesome guy he was. And they went out and they tracked down people who served on the submarine with him. And they just had the most glowing and amazing and humorous and uplifting stories to tell about L. Ron Hubbard that there's just no part of me and no part of anyone watching that event that would question it. Like it's almost like – these people and these people who were telling these stories weren't Scientologists. Like they went out, assuming they weren't just actors. Um, yeah. You know, they went and tracked these people down, and they told the most amazing stories of what it was like to serve under L. Ron Hubbard in the military. And it just reinforced um, anything we'd ever been told about him, of what he was like as a person, and what he was like as a soldier and a leader, and all that stuff. Well, no, certainly they, that Danny Sherman heads up the biographical project and L. Ron Hubbard. And see, this is one thing I, I never understood. Uh, L. Ron Hubbard could have taken great pride in serving World War II, serving his country in World War II as a naval officer. Right. That in and of itself it was a, a, an accomplishment of what, they, of what Tom Brokaw has called the greatest generation. Right. And I never understood because I had family in World War II. And L. Ron Hubbard did command uh, a sub chaser, the PC-815. He claims to have sunk two Japanese submarines. There was never any evidence. The church never funded an expedition. Mm -hmm. And I've written, uh, Aaron, that um, Gus, Grim Gus Grissom, an American astronaut, he was in a Mercury space capsule. Mm. When it, uh, and I was, a, I was a kid, I followed the space program. When uh, Gus Grissom's capsule parachuted back to Earth, mm -hmm. it sunk. Now, they saved Gus Grissom, who, who later died in the uh, Apollo fire with two other astronauts, but they, this, the capsule sank mm. in deep water, so at something like 16,000 feet of water. Wow. Now, you fast forward uh, maybe 10 years ago, a team actually found Gus Grissom's capsule, which was the size of a Volkswagen, mm -hmm in like 16,000 feet of water. That's deep. So the question I posed at the Church of Scientology, if L. Ron Hubbard sank two Kadai Imperial class submarines, and they're big, they're over 300 feet long, mm -hmm. you could easily find them. Why haven't they funded things, you know, to, and th th this is just one of my pet peeves, I guess, because I find it so offensive that they would call L. Ron Hubbard a war hero that, who won medals when he didn't. Right. And anyone who's ever served their country, and I, I, I'm, I'm not a veteran, but I'm just saying it, it, it's something the church doesn't doesn't have to lie about. It's true, and it wouldn't be that expensive. I mean, look at the money that they spend just going to buy and rehabilitate houses that LRH spent a year or two living in. Like people actually want to go and see these things. Um, you know, there's probably five or six different properties around the world that they've purchased and rehabilitated just so someone could be in the same building LRH was once in. Um, uh, if they wanted to, they could easily go and find that submarine. Well, if it was there, and if they wanted well, to. <laughs> well, the submarine's obviously, obviously not there. But, but, and, and I think the point I was making is, uh, L. Ron Hubbard, he, they've had to 
you know, come off his biography and back down quite a bit. Right. And if you use the Wayback Machine, you can see claims they were making in the 80s, and they keep backing them down in the light of, of current scholarship. But you believed that L. Ron Hubbard was substantially as you were being told. Absolutely. No question about it. Now, when you saw it going clear, did it change your mind about L. Ron Hubbard? <laughs> well, um, you know, there's... Oh, well, well, the answer is yes, it did. But, you know, I've had kind of a, a gradual and long runway over the last five or six years of, you know, learning more and more and more about uh, about his real life. But Going Clear definitely uh, provided details I had never seen before, even in other online, you know, sources of data that, that discusses uh, L. Ron Hubbard's prior life. It was, it, was, it was pretty impactful. It was pretty impactful, yeah. Well, what was your, to that point, what was you know, the crack in the Truman Show for you, when did you first start having doubts about the Church of Scientology? So this is really interesting. Um, when I left the Sea Org in 2006 with my wife, um, we were having our first baby. Um, even when I left the Sea Org, I was not disaffected in any way with Scientology, uh, with the Sea Org, with David Miscavige, with the LRH, or anything like that. If anything, I just thought that the, the Sea Orgs in Los Angeles were pieces of crap, and, and the only reason they were that way is because they weren't as close to, as, to, the, to the way David Miscavige would want them as Flag was. Like everything in my mind was still David Miscavige is the best, and if an org is a piece of crap, it's because it's not the way he would want it. So that's still the way I was thinking up until that point. It wasn't until almost a year and a half, almost two years later, that um, – it was actually Jason Begay's. Jason Begay's videos was the first thing for me that made me go, "Oh my goodness, something is wrong here." Um, because you know, in my generation of training at Flag in that period from 1993 to 1996, we uh, there was about a thousand staff members from other orgs training at Flag at that time, and there are certain rules about who can see Scientology's technical training films that are on the auditor training courses. Those rules were thrown out the window, and all of the auditor trainees were forced to, or allowed to, however you want to think about it, watch every film that existed in Scientology over and over and over again every single week. Like every week we would watch these films over and over again. Jason Begay's in most of them. And so to us, Jason Begay was like our Tom Cruise. Oh, I understand, he, yeah. He was like our superstar. And when I was in the Sea Org, I was actually there during the time. I, I now have hindsight of, is 2020, I've heard Jason Begay's story of, what he was going through at this time. I was actually there when they were trying to salvage him. I'm using the Scientology word, of course, but really? trying to recover him. Try this is the period where he was basically saying, you know, fix me, fix me. I I'm here. I want to be fixed. I don't want to have all these doubts. I don't want to be everyone's asshole. Uh, make me better. I, I like he was having trouble with his auditing. His L rundowns didn't go well. I was there when the senior CS of Astro Day was personally auditing um, Jason to try to basically get him back in the fold. So to see two years later, but I, you understand that when I saw that happening, I didn't know that was like a recovery action. I just figured, you know, sure. he wanted auditing and so they were giving him the best. That's just what I thought when I, at the time. So two years later, when I see him telling this story, my first thought is, if they can't keep someone like Jason Begay from being so dissatisfied with his auditing, and so upset with the organization. If they can't keep this guy from leaving, something's wrong because he's so important. Him leaving, they now have to automatically reproduce every film he was in. That's that's not cheap, right? No, no, not at all. Um, <clears throat> so even from, from a financial perspective, much less just a human perspective, there were reasons for the church to make damn sure Jason Begay did not walk away unhappy. And they failed to do that. And so that was the first crack in the armor. Karen, thank you for sharing with our audience what it was like for you as a former Sea Org member when actor Jason McGay publicly departed the Church of Scientology in 2008. In part two of our interview with Aaron Smith-Levin, you're going to hear a shocking tale of depravity from Scientology's flag land base in Clearwater, Florida. And as longtime Scientology watchers have always said, the Church of Scientology is always worse than you think, and this tale is worse than you think. For Surviving Scientology Radio, this is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Thank you for listening, and as always, we'll be in very good touch.